now. All right, everyone, thank you for being here today. Welcome to the International Center for Cooperative Management's Special Topics Management and Governance series to help elevate the cooperative sector. And so I think many of you are familiar here on the line today, some even grads from our programs, but just to flag that we are known for our online master's program in cooperative and credit union management, and now since then have expanded into a graduate diploma and a certificate in co-op management online, as well as now online two-day executive education courses. And uh, as well, we do uh, study tours when times allow for that, <laughs> and so much more. <laughs> so, um, you know, please stay in touch with us and know that we, we do these webinars so that we can sort of add into the conversation of what's happening in the sector, but there's a whole lot happening uh, within our center beyond that too, research and publications and the like. Um, so this is a thrilling time today, truly, because these are topics that I feel like a lot of people wrestle with and we want to know what does it mean in action. And so this is the second in a two-part mini-series on Indigenous rights and inclusion in cooperatives. And uh, so if you missed our session last week, we have that on our YouTube channel and, uh, and links from managementstudies.coop as well. And I'll put it in the chat here for folks who are here today. Uh, but really our goals with this mini-series are to build more fluency and gather context for addressing these issues in our cooperatives and building a more inclusive economy overall. I feel like in the co-op sector, certainly we find this within the education that we do, that we focus a lot on economic inclusion and, uh, and rem you know, need to remember all of the intersections that, that come with that um, in terms of access for everyone. Um, we want to dig into the inherent link between the cooperative model and inclusion efforts. And we want to give participants tangible takeaways to be able to action inclusion, whatever that looks like in your context. So policies, management and governance practices and the like. So we're thrilled to have three speakers here today who generously give their time often <laughs> um, to, to share with us, to share their experiences and to help us all in achieving those goals today. So. Um, the first is Mary Nirlangalak, who resides in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and is the Corporate Secretary and Vice President of Corporate Services with Arctic Cooperatives Limited. Um, for any of you involved in the co-op sector, you probably know Mary's name and face and have, have seen her speak at many events. Um, Mary has over 20 years experience in Indigenous governance and has presented around the world on Indigenous topics related to cooperatives and governance. Um, she has represented the interests of Arctic cooperatives and the member co-ops of Arctic um, at Cooperatives and Mutuals Canada uh, with Federated Cooperatives and with the Manitoba Cooperative Association and a lot more. The, the list goes on with all of the involvement that Mary's had um, in other organizations. Um, we also have Joanne Stone Campbell, who is the manager for Indigenous Partnerships at Van City Credit Union on the west coast of Canada. Um, she has a long history of supporting Indigenous prosperity and community health. And in her role with Van City, she's building capacity for Indigenous housing, entrepreneurship, financial literacy and broader partnerships between indigenous communities and organizations with the credit union. Her emphasis is on trust building and putting people first. We're thrilled to have you here today. Thank you, Joanne. And Joanne is in a, a newer um, role with Fan City overall. And so I thank you for your generosity in joining us <laughs> at this stage as you have so many things ahead of you that you want to roll out. Um, as well as lots of work behind you already too. So we appreciate that. Um, and Lisa Clatney is the executive director of the Saskatoon Community Clinic, uh, which is a cooperative. And she has a lengthy background in community health and health services. And the cooperative uh, nature of the clinic is a guiding framework for decisions and the governance of the clinic. So thank you to our three speakers for being here today. Uh, very impressive uh, work that all of them are engaged in and I think will help us in uh, learning more and knowing where to go next in the work that we do. I should also mention that I'm Erin Hancock. I'm the program manager for the education programs with the International Center of Cooperative Management out of St. Mary's University. 
And so I welcome anyone to follow up with me on anything that's raised here today or any ideas you have for future webinars and, and work that we can all do together. So jumping into things, I will um, first do a round with all of the panelists to uh, ask if you want to, first of all, fill in anything that I didn't cover in your bios today. That was sort of the, the short story. Um, if you want to tell us a little bit more about your cooperative so we know the context by which you're um, taking on you know, the inclusion work that you're taking on, and also what brings you uh, to the table today in terms of specifically around the topic of Indigenous inclusion. So perhaps I'll ask Joanne uh, to start. Hi, um, I'm Joanne Stone Campbell. I carry uh, three names, Iyanowit, which is from the Squamish Nation, where I am sharing from today um, on their traditional territory in West Vancouver, BC. I also carry a spirit name, the sound of Thunderbird speaking. And I also carry another name that I was adopted into a family, which is um, Melody. Um, so I'm very fortunate to have the strength of my, my families and my communities in the, in the work that I do and, and always um, carrying our family and the next generation and the past generation with me as I speak. Uh, I want to acknowledge again, I'm on the traditional territory of the Squamish Nation. And um, that's what we do at Van City as well. Uh, we make sure that everyone acknowledges the traditional territory that they're working on. Um, and we try to do that in every one of our meetings uh, so that people get to know their First Nations that they're um, connected to. Uh, some people don't know, so we ask them to do a little research, figure it out, how to pronounce it properly, and uh, yeah, start creating those relationships because they're very important. You know, we. We want them to be, um, we want all our staff. We have about 37 Indigenous staff at Van City. Um, I don't think that's very high. I hope to increase that uh, over time um, because I think it's a need, um, you know, as we're working towards reconciliation in our, uh, in Van City. Um, so we, you know, we want to uh, create that place, a safe place for our members to come into our branches or come to work for us. And um, yeah, I'm just very excited to be here and to learn more and to hear the other speakers and uh, make connections uh, in this line of work. Um, I've only been in this line for about a year. Um, I've started in banking many, many years ago, um, just frontline work. Um, but Van City has, um, I guess it really, it aligned with my values as an individual, as an Indigenous woman. Um, giving back to my community is, is something that I hold, um, yeah, in high regard. It's, it's, it's not about what Van City does for our community, it's what our community does for Van City. I really think we could bring some, um, some strengths and some knowledge um, some new ways of thinking. So I'm really excited about uh, those next steps in, in this role. Yeah, I'm just excited to be here. There's lots of stuff to share, but I won't take up all the time. Thank you, Joanne. And thank you for reminding me to voice it. I've added it into the chat too, but I wanted to acknowledge that where we're located here with St. Mary's University and what's known as Halifax now is located on Mi'kmaq territory, the unceded and never surrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq people. So I, I appreciate that. I've always appreciated that about Van City. I feel like you all were bringing that into meetings well before it became something more commonplace. So I very much appreciate that. Let's move now to, uh, Lisa, and then we'll move on to Mary, who will then um, do a presentation as well. Go ahead, Lisa. Good morning, everyone, or at least it's morning where I am in, South, in Sask, sorry, Saskatchewan. So we are one of uh, Canada's largest cooperative primary health care centers. We serve uh, about 13,000 patients in the city of Saskatoon, which is located on uh, Treaty 6 territory and traditional homeland of the Métis. Our cooperative was established in 1962. And so we operate out of two locations in Saskatoon, one in the downtown area and one in the inner city or core neighborhoods, which serves a, a more under-resourced community. 
Um, and although we have members and we encourage all of our uh, citizens and patients to be members, we provide primary health care to the broader community of Saskatoon, not just exclusive to members. Um, the Saskatoon Community Clinic has a very robust interdisciplinary team approach to how we provide primary health care. And so our services and our teams look a little bit different depending on what location, but essentially we provide, you know, primary care services such as physicians, nurse practitioner. We also have mental health, lab, pharmacy, OT, PT, um, outreach workers, and we all kind of work together to support the clients that we serve. So as a member owned consumer cooperative, our values of collaboration, engagement and equity and being people centered are really our guide, guideposts for how we deliver our programs and services. But in about 2017, I think as an organization, we realized that we needed to have perhaps a more focused effort on how we engage and partnered with our Indigenous clients to truly move forward with some of the actions related to the principles of, of truth and reconciliation. And so since that time, we've, uh, we've went on a, a journey and it's been really exciting. And uh, I look forward to sharing uh, some of what we've done at the Saskatoon Community Clinic, but also learning from others on this uh, meeting about what they've done and, and what they've been able to achieve and, and lessons learned. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. And Mary, the floor is yours. And I, I know that you're prepared with some slides to share about Arctic Cooperatives, but feel free if you want to give a bit more in terms of the, the lines of business and the types of activity that Arctic um, does as well. So we have a sense of, well, how much you all do and all the essential services that you're involved in offering. Well, thank you very much for this. Um, so I'm bringing up the slide so that I can speak to it. Um, can you see the slide in the, in the format? Can, we can. Is that coming up? Yes, perfect. perfect. So um, I want to thank everyone to, uh, to, that's participating uh, to this uh, inclusion of Indigenous people, um, first of all. Um, it uh, seems like it's been a topic of the year. Um, and I say that because this is the third time I'm asked to speak on Indigenous um, into the cooperative movement, and, which is so nice to see um, that uh, uh, it's foreseen in uh, a long time coming before, um, I guess uh, I mentioned to um, Erin that when this topic comes up, it comes in waves. Every so many years you're asked and then it goes away and comes back again. And I'm saying that for a good reason, but it, cause it does come in waves. <laughs> uh, there are a certain time of the year that um, we're asked to speak and then we're it goes away and then comes back in that sense. Um, but in this um, presentation, I'm going to touch on Arctic Cooperative. And I know FC and Q is here as well. Um, they're in the same field of uh, Inuit communities um, uh, in Northern Quebec and as well, um, Arctic Cooperative being in Nunavut Territory and uh, Northwest Territories and Yukon. Um, and I actually putting this uh, presentation forward uh, here first because uh, part of my job here at Arctic Cooperative, as much as I look after the governance of Arctic Cooperative, which is a seven board members and they're all from the Arctic uh, community. Um, um, one of the other things that I do um, is that orientate new staff that are going into the Arctic community. Um, uh, so that's part of my job as well. And I show this for a reason because um, uh, often uh, when Indigenous uh, is mentioned, they were kind of plunking to one um, kind of pot and then expect that they were all the same. We're very, very diverse um, Indigenous community and I'm giving you from the Inuit perspective. Uh, one of the other things that um, I wanted to touch on the governance component uh, and the board of directors are from the member co-ops in the Arctic communities. And um, representation uh, is uh, regional based. Uh, we have uh, directors from by region. It's a large country in um, the Arctic community. So it's a very lot of logistic, lot of um, uh, areas that we cover. Um, one of the other things is that as much as the, it's the cooperation amongst cooperative is very rich. Um, uh, one of the things that um, concern for community uh, is huge um, around mental health and food security. And I wanted to touch on this one as well, that uh, representation of um, 
uh, gender balance, uh, there's 51% uh, of them are, are female um, on the governance component at the member co-op location. And it's important to have that balance um, because there's uh, representation is, is important. From the Inuit perspective, um, like in the sense of the territories that I'm mentioning, uh, seven districts, uh, we have seven districts uh, all from the Arctic community, anywhere from Resolute Bay, as you see in the map, uh, then Lutsuke in Northwest Territories, and all the way down to Hudson's Bay, Sandy Kilowak, um, where uh, FC and Q are in the Northern Quebec region, Okro, Yukon, and so on. So I'm putting this out there so part of the conversation we'll have later on. Um, one of the other things that uh, being Indigenous owned um, federation, uh, we're in Winnipeg location, uh, but our members are in the Arctic community. How did that come about? Um, so that's a long history that uh, we could actually uh, have a discussion, a, a separate discussion. But to be inclusive, um, how do we be inclusive when there's very diverse uh, Indigenous people uh, across Canada? Um, we have to, we have to be part of it. Um, the language are diverse, terminology uh, and maintaining it because we know across Canada, indigenous language is being lost very quickly because English um, spoken uh, is very prominent. It's so strong that it's, it's lost in a lot of the languages. And so um, we consider the dialects and uh, um, we're dealing with five different languages and dialect spoken and those kind of things. But how do we be inclusive? We do try our part um, in trying to maintain because it's uh, legislated in Nunavut territory. Um, we do official languages as much as we can in translation. Um, I mean, when I'm speaking, I'd rather speak in my own language, but I can't because, again, English is spoken across Canada. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to touch on, the language component as well, to be inclusive and um, uh, uh, the, the language in, the, um, in Canada is English and French. Those are two official languages. But in our communities, in our territories, the indigenous language is, is our first language, but it's not recognized. And in, being inclusive is something that is not even center of anybody's mind that it's their first official language, but we have to adjust to the English or French language. And that's something that needs to really change in our business line, I guess, is one of the things that I wanted to touch on. And you see in the map here, of the diversity of the language and culture. It's right across from, um, um, from um, coast to coast to coast. And uh, there's three coasts. And so, so often when there's a presentation, they say one coast to coast. And they forget there's a third coast in the Arctic Canada. And this is something to be inclusive and be cognizant of, of the languages and the culture um, in the various um, Arctic community. One of the other things is that um, when uh, we hire staff that is going into the Arctic Canada, um, I do the orientation um, and I say to um, the individuals that are doing orientation with, I said, I can only speak to you, but until you're actually in those communities, it's hard to describe it. But we tr I try to do my part just so that it's not a culture shock because it's a totally different culture that itself. And one of the things is that covering from various culture differences, uh, too often what happens is that somebody goes into the community and try to change the people. It should never be that case. The person that's going into the community is to be the one that is changing for the community. Um, the climate itself is off, I touch on as well. The weather factor, um, the environment, uh, the hunting, um, fishing, gathering, and families. And this is one of the things is that um, uh, in the Arctic community, uh, diet is important. And uh, diet is something that um, we're, we eat um, what we catch and those kind of things. The 24-hour daylight that is happening, the 24-hour darkness that is happening, you are, you're going to have to make a huge adjustment and just to be part of that so that it's not a huge adjustment um, so that's one of the part of the things that I do on the inclusionness of um, going into the Arctic community. And um, one of the things I mentioned earlier about um, it comes in waves, being uh, included in the presentation, it should be throughout every day of our life, 
being inclusive and in, into something that is diverse. And it's, it's got a rich history in the Arctic, uh, in the, um, across Canada. And it should be long. It should never, it should not be, oh, let's do this part and then put it in the shelf and then come back when we make a difference. It should be continuously um, consistent uh, as well, uh, being inclusive in policy making and, uh, and so on, and reflective of the people in the community. Um, so that it's um, tr not to tr try to, uh, oh, it worked here in one community, let's do it here. The every community is different from each other. And that's my presentation for the time being, and I'll stop sharing so that I can get back into the, uh, to that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. And for folks who aren't as familiar with Arctic cooperatives, because we have some folks from the US and, and other countries here um, today as well. Can you tell us a little bit about what does, what's the business of Arctic cooperatives? What services do you all offer? Thank you for that. Um, so Arctic uh, Cooperative is a service federation that provides services to the retail operation in across the territory. Our major uh, business line is uh, retail first, and some of the uh, the communities have uh, uh, Inns North and its hotel. Like there are many rural community. If you're in a rural community, there are small town communities. That's basically what they are. Uh, some of them have um, majority of them have cable services as well. Um, uh, government contracts such as uh, fuel delivery, uh, that's another line of um, uh, business that they do, as well as um, uh, construction department. So it's a very diverse company. An Arctic cooperative supports uh, anywhere from human resources to uh, merchandising and logistics. Just imagine doing business in the Arctic where there is no road. Um, so everything is flown into those communities. It's up in the Northwest Territories where there's road, but the logistic of it is huge. Um, like in the FCNQ, everything that is brought up into those communities, they go in by ship once a year. Just imagine doing business, getting your product once a year, and how do you manage that and logistically um, uh, try to provide anything that is required in that community. So it's a very diverse um, business. We're also in partnership with the um, various business so that uh, we try to make it work with the uh, uh, lift company um, out of Montreal, uh, with the airline uh, as well, and as well as with First Nation Bank, um, because as a lot of these communities don't have banking services. And so how do we try to balance out um, um, business line and into those communities. If there's other businesses, um, the other thing that we provide is marketing, uh, anything governance, uh, anything where financial um, financial statements and Arctic Cooperative provides those services to those 32 member location. It's a very complex, <laughs> wide ranging um, list of services, definitely. Um, Amazing. So thank you for that. Thank you for the context piece. Thank you for framing our conversation today too. And, and also, you know, giving a bit about, you know, your context and your uh, perspectives on this as well. Um, and I see that some folks are also adding in the chat, the territories that they're on and insights and whatnot so far, please continue to do that. Um, so let's open it up to the three panelists and asking. So I imagine a lot of folks here on the line are interested in the specifics. So what specifically are you all doing around policies, procedures, conversations, practices, whether that's in HR or governance or how you manage your membership, um, anywhere within your, your cooperative organization um, in terms of, of doing the work of indigenous inclusion and honoring rights? Um, so I'll let whoever steps forward that wants to jump into that first. Joanne, would you like to start? Sure. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, so since I've come on, um, we've got some exciting projects. Um, actually, trying to get our numbers up to um, hiring more Indigenous people. And um, I guess that's where I want to want to share as well. I'm a, a First Nations woman who grew up on a reserve and live on a reserve today. Um, and 
So Van City not just got uh, an indigenous person, they got a person who's lived the life of a First Nations person on a small community of 50 people. My, my family, we grew up trapping in Northern Ontario, uh, living off the land. Um, first one to get an education, uh, at grade 12, which is really sad. Uh, and then post-secondary education. So, you know, bring that wealth of knowledge and plus living in a community. And I tell people, you know, I owned a condo in the city, uh, stayed there for a while, but then moved on back onto the reserve in West Vancouver, which is really, really big uh, community. So I'm bringing all this knowledge of who I am, the lifestyle I lived from an urban setting to a small remote community in Northern Ontario. Um, and that wealth of knowledge is not everybody has. Um, so learning two different cultures, live in two different worlds, um, uh, speaking on behalf of my people and not all of my people, uh, you know, some people I've spoke to. So we're looking at, um, I educate people on, it's not what Van City could do for our communities. Again, it's what our communities, what Van City can learn from our communities. Uh, we were the first entrepreneurs. We were the first in a lot of things. So I think we have to bring that knowledge back and, and Van City is open to learning about who we are as Indigenous people. We come from all walks of life. Uh, some speak the language, some don't. Some were born in foster care, some were 60 school, some were residential school. So, you know, honoring um, each person uh, where they're coming from. And again, some of our Indigenous people and, and BC don't know the history of uh, Indigenous people. So we do a lot of that internally to educate our staff um, about who we are and where we're going and, and the wealth of our people. Um, so I'm really excited about that. We're, we're talking about indigenous housing, how we could bring um, uh, indigenous housing, uh, those products to the communities, First Nations communities. Each one is totally different. So again, thinking outside the box, how could we, it's not just one product, it has to be, um, it has to it has to fit into the system of the First Nations community, depending on their land code or, or uh, stuff like that that they need. Um, yeah, so entrepreneurship is a, another thing. Again, being the first entrepreneurs and in, in, uh, growing up and the uh, trapping system that my family did, and you know, as a young person, I was thought I would we're so poor. You know, um, we're. We don't have a lot now that I'm older and lived life a little bit. I'm thinking my mom's still out there. She's in her 70s raising two little kids, uh, great grandchildren, and still out there trapping, fishing, hunting. And I see the little kids now, they're not on their iPhones or, or computers. They're out there doing the work. And I'm just like, oh my God, I, that's the way I grew up. So. I'm just very excited to share some of those teachings that I, my parents have gave me so that I can give other people that we live a different life. So we have different experiences. So we want to, right now we're working on indigenizing some of the, the teaching tools that we have at Van City um, with financial literacy. I'm doing a whole history lesson right now. We're teaching about financial literacy, but we don't have an indigenous content to it. We want to blend that in, whether it's bringing the elders and, and bringing um, uh, the marketing and pictures of our Indigenous people and um, some of our stories, uh, some of our Indigenous um, financial, what that means to us. Copper shield, hot latches, you know, all that kind of stuff to bring in, because that's our wealth, right? Our, our language, our history. Um, so I'm very excited uh, where we can go. Um, we're doing um, some work around um, Indigenous lending. We just hired, we just developed a new uh, Indigenous lending team. Because when I came on, it was like, okay, so what do we have to offer 
indigenous people. And I'm not the expert in everything. There's experts in all different areas. So now we're gathering, we're doing a journey, a journey um, looking at the journey of indigenous people and what does that look like on the First Nation or urban? Um, how can we best help them? How, could, how can our service best help our communities? And again, working together with our communities, looking at what's working for them, what's not working for them, and trying to build that pathways that is a quick response, not two years down the road, um, but a response that we could have now. Um, so yeah, uh, a lot of work on reconciliation that we're doing and um, yeah, honoring our land. So uh, respecting our land and our resources, uh, the food systems and uh, fishing. So we're bringing a lot of that knowledge back in to honor our people. Thank you very much. I mean, you have such an incredible role because you're sort of like the internal consultant on all of these things. Like you say, there's all these experts in the organization on their various things and you get to sort of look across and see um, where things could be inclusive, augmented, you know, um, that's incredible. I'm, I'm glad your role exists and it sounds like you're certainly the right person for it. <laughs> and, well, and you know that I'm the first indigenous person to be in this role. Hmm. So kudos to Van City before it was non-indigenous people in these roles. And now they can say we do have a, a First Nations woman who has life experience and has an experience of being indigenous um, and uh, sharing that knowledge. Absolutely. Thank you. Lisa, did you want to share about a little bit about the community clinic in terms of um, what you all have been doing in terms of inclusion, what that looks like in your practices? Sure. Um, I think what the Saskatoon Community Clinic has tried to do is really permeate all of our inclusion practices at every level of organization. And so first and foremost, that involves hearing from our members and hearing from our clients around how they experience the care that we're providing them. But then it really is to go all the way up through our organization and looking at our staff and also looking at our board. And so um, I'll maybe just start there. One of the things that our board did was really reflect on who was making up the board and whether or not that was actually representative of the clients that we were serving. And so um, they felt that maybe there was some room for improvement. And so for the past few years, they've really focused on um, ensuring that they are a board that's representative of all of the patients that we serve in Saskatoon. And they've really done a great job of kind of diversifying their, their board. Um, the, a few things we've done is we have a, we're mandated to do a, like a provincial patient experience survey with all of our clients. And when we really looked at that survey, we also felt that it wasn't really providing us with meaningful information for the care that we were providing um, at some of our clinics. And so we kind of, we developed that survey in conjunction with um, some of our patient staff and a group of elders that we work with to make sure that we were asking the important questions. And so now we, we ask questions around, you know, whether or not clients feel that their healthcare system or their healthcare providers are being respectful of their culture, their beliefs, and their values. And then we're actually using that data to inform what we're doing. It's one thing to ask the question, but you have to be prepared to kind of take that next step and think about, okay, this is what we've heard, which can often be humbling. Um, and you have to show a little bit of vulnerability to be okay with getting back information that maybe you're not doing as well in some areas as you had thought or you hoped you would be. But it's really important then that you work with others to, to try to improve that. Um, we also are as a cooperative, I think, and, and certainly Saskatoon Community Clinic really has a lot of partnerships and we pride ourselves on working with partners in the community. And, and that's also been very important for us. So we have partnerships with um, specific Indigenous organizations and we really work together and we kind of build off of each other's strengths to better serve the community. Um, and so the Saskatoon Community Clinic often does what it's really well at and that's providing primary health care, but we realize that there's gaps in what we do. And so we partner with 
other organizations, for example, the Saskatoon Tribal Council, to help kind of provide more of that holistic wraparound care for services. So one example we heard when we had um, asked our clients, so one of the things that they wanted access to was traditional healing practices. And we had to stop and think around, like, was that something that the Saskatoon Community Clinic should be doing? Is that appropriate for us to be doing? Or is it that we could partner with another organization that actually does that really well, but just make sure that our clients and our patients knew how to access that. So that's also some of the things that we've, you can't be all things to all people, but I think when you work in partnership across community, you can kind of help build on each other's strengths to make sure that you're serving the clients in the best possible way. Um, we've been really fortunate at the Saskatoon Community Clinic to also work with this, a small group of elders who have been uh, patients and members of the clinic, but have allowed us to kind of use them as uh, an incredible resource. And really, they've created a safe space for us as a staff to, to talk with them and ask, you know, how can we be doing things better or we're thinking about this, like, what do you think? Should, is this something we could move forward on? And so we've really worked in partnership with them um, and they've really been instrumental in guiding a lot of our um, practices and programs that we do in particular at our West Side uh, clinic location. Um, and then we also, they've also really helped with a lot of the education for our staff, which is hugely critical. So. Um, we've, we do a number of things and we kind of strategize at the beginning of the year of, of what that's going to look like. And now with the pandemic, obviously, a lot of our staff training has been put on hold. But we do um, engage in a lot of different programs and offer opportunities for staff to learn about um, the history of, of colonization. Um, we go through uh, just lots of training opportunities or hearing uh, people that have received uh, services from our organization speak about their history and how we can be doing things better, which has been hugely powerful for us. And we try to offer those opportunities uh, for all of our staff, including our, our board members and the community agencies that we partner with. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll stop at that. There's some things that we're kind of planning in the future, which is to partner more with um, post-secondary educational centers and as part of our recruitment strategies which I think will be hugely um, important for us to do. Um, and we're also just getting a, a diversity and inclusion committee internal um, off the ground. And so lots of exciting things. It's, it's definitely a journey and it's, it's a process. Um, but I think the biggest part for us has been partnering with those organizations or individuals that can kind of help guide and shape our practices. That's excellent. I, I think that you and Joanne have both raised many things that are concrete so far in terms of what folks can be doing in an actionable way. So great. Mary, do you want to add into that? Get a little bit deeper into the specifics? So, you know, you talked about your, your governance model, you talked a bit about the consultation and about staff who maybe are, are not from the North, but going there to work in the orientation process. Do you want to say anything else about sort of the specifics of how it plays out in, a, in, in the environment at Arctic Co-ops? All of a sudden, the, yeah, the mic froze there for a second. Thank you for that. Um, yes. Um, because the, the Arctic communities are so diverse, um, sensitivity is something that we're very aware of uh, when we do make business decision. Um, we're always aware to make sure that, um, uh, that because I'm giving it from an Inuit perspective, I can't give a Dene perspective at all. That's something when I'm doing my orientation, I'm very clear with that. Uh, because that's what I know. Um, I, I can't um, go to another culture and say this is what the culture is like because that's not my area uh, as well. So being sensitive, uh, being sensitive to the various area that you're working on and being aware of that particular community is so important because it makes a huge difference. There's nothing worse when you do something wrong is to try to make up for it that's worse than trying to uh, to be uh, from the business side. The other thing in the um, orientation that um, when staff that are not from the Arctic community, 
uh, one of the other things that I try to say that to them that um, there's a long history. Uh, it was mentioned about colonization um, and um, in, in, in the indigenous community, uh, a lot of the communities were settled into um, um, community setting and uh, the Arctic community is no different um, from the residential school to settlements into the community and, and, and so on. It's only about 50, 55 years ago to 60 years ago. Uh, that's not even lot long. That's our parents' generation, our grandparents' generation that went through this big change in a short period of time. And, um, and we wonder why there's issues in these communities and to adapt continuously to what is asked to do and expect them to um, people to understand it. it. You can't understand it until you actually live those communities. And it's hard to um, mention those things. And the experiences are so raw to people that um, it's hard to explain it. And so uh, being sensitive is, a, I guess, um, is the biggest thing that uh, people have to be aware of. Um, and uh, the one of the orientation that I try to give them is that understand the history of that community of what they experience and um, being aware and decision making uh, being aware of uh, the, the people I said you'll learn more from the people than um, the instead of trying to make a difference in there like if you go in a community with a mindset that this is what I'm going to change it's not going to work you're going to get a backlash from that perspective so it's, it's, it's important to be sensitive ar around that as well and the um, because of the operations are very diverse in the uh, in the in the community, um, and how do you balance uh, business to the the culture and and the various things? But again, you're in the business, and the, the members is the one that um, wants those businesses, and you adapt uh, to what the needs are. Uh, consultation is so important uh, when you're doing business, um, and uh, make them. The decision making um, aspect. Uh, I think there's a, in these cases a lot of times we impose so much um, to people, imposing and uh, in, be, instead of inclusion, um, that there's a big difference in there. And uh, imposing to say this is what's going to work for you, it's not going to work that way. You need to be more inclusive in what you're doing, and having those discussions is so important. And if I start questioning myself as much as I grew up in the Arctic, I go back to the people that are from my home community and I say, how would they approach these sort of things? So those, even though I, I grew up in there, I have to change my mindset as well because they're, I may be looking at from the business aspect and I have to rethink my thought again, just try to be more inclusive. Uh, that helps me ground myself as well. Um, and uh, from the, uh, the perspective of the individual, um, and the, it's so important uh, that um, uh, if you want to be inclusive, is to understand. Uh, I can't emphasize this enough. Em understand the people, um, learn from them. Even just making a difference of speaking the language, saying "Ublak good is good morning," and those basic fundamental might. Uh, be small, but they make a they make a big difference of trying to uh, speak the language and being part of it and being inclusive is something that I think is so uh, important from that aspect. So I'll end there for time being. That's wonderful. Thank you. I, I wanted to sort of recap some of those specifics that you all have named today that I think we can all see how it can apply in our context. So. Um, ensuring that Indigenous and First Nations people are um, considered in hiring practices, uh, making sure that products fit the communities and remembering that there's diversity between the communities, um, that we can't just say, oh, we'll apply a, a, an Indigenous lens or a First Nations lens to something that there's so much more diversity within that in terms of you know, traditions, culture, language, um, uh, Joanne had mentioned about, you know, looking how to indigenize some of the, the product services and activities of Van City. So in, in with the financial literacy program as an example, and does that mean bringing in elders? Does that mean that the marketing has more images of folks who are um, First Nations and more stories related to the types of, of business activities that your cooperative does uh, and credit unions? Um, 
um, looking at board representation to make sure that your board does in fact represent your membership and or your um, your clients or and the broader community. Um, and I think for those of us who are in spaces that maybe are predominantly white, to ask then um, how do we sort of put the, the cart before the horse and saying how can we showcase um, folks in, in positions of leadership so that other folks can then say, oh, this is a space that I can be in. I, I can see that I'm represented here, folks like me are. Um, establishing partnerships so that um, I think as Lisa said, you don't have to be everything to everyone, but by acknowledging what the needs are and then finding partners who are experts, that's a great way to expand it. Um, Mary talked about orientation um, and, and really instilling the idea that we're, that we're thinking about these things, not just you know when we're doing our strategic planning, not just when we're called on, uh, I'm, in, I'm inserting that, but not just when we're called on um, the fact that we're not being inclusive in our practices um, and not just thinking about it once every three years, that it's something that, that we think about and throughout our organizations, um, that we take more of a, an approach of being consult, con, consulting and, and consultation as opposed to imposing ideas. Um, yeah, and I mean, there were lots of other things mentioned too, but I, I think that all of those and, and you talked about learning some of the language, Mary. Um, you know, I think that these are great steps in the right direction that hopefully of that sort of menu that you've presented so far, folks are seeing ways um, that they can, you know, do more of this good work. And so I wanted to um, ask folks to be adding to the chat if they, if they have examples from their own organizations where they are already doing good work and or learning as they're going, meaning, you know, this is a safe space to share your failures as well, because we all learn from that as well. But I wonder if any of the panelists want to comment on um, anything that you're learning or any of those <laughs> things that you've tried that maybe weren't the right thing or any of the things that you've seen happen in your organization where we thought okay we have to change this and do it differently now that we're taking this lens um did anybody want to jump in on that one sure i could start um you know i i think as indigenous people we have such a we want we want to be from what i hear from my past students, we want to be treated equal. We want to be, we want it. We want what other people want. Um, and, and that doorway to be open um, both ways, I guess. But, you know, even though I look in this position now, I'm still reporting to a lot of non-Indigenous people. So there's many layers above me. I can't change that, or maybe I can influence it, uh, hopefully in the very near future. Um, to get those higher level Indigenous people um, who could make change. We do have an Indigenous, uh, a First Nations youth hired uh, on our board of directors, which is the first time that just started this fall. So that's a great mm -hmm. step. Um, but it, we're still at the first stage. We have the first one in HR, we have one here, one there, you know, so it's, it's some small changes. Um, I want to see big changes made quickly. Uh, I'm tired of this one person step. Um, so I think it's, um, you know, we have an Indigenous ER uh, group, employee resource group. Um, so, you know, we're trying to build that even, we're trying to build that group, but we're still spread pretty thin when people ask for support in the Indigenous, especially my position, you're spread to really, really thin. Um, so, you know, we have to really watch those things. We're doing some work on anti-racism right now uh, with some of the issues with um, that's happening in the financial institute world of other banks and credit unions of looking how we can make a difference. What are we learning from what's happened outside of, um, well, in our bank and other banks. Um, so we're trying to, trying to learn and, and to give uh, the best experience for our Indigenous people coming into the bank. It's, it's going to take some time. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, and um, I would like to see some change for our Indigenous people for um, 
increasing our breathment leave. Indigenous people, especially in our communities, there's such a high um, rate of um, suicides, death, uh, elders, and now with COVID, um, I just believe we just, we're such big families that to take one day off to mourn your family, it just is not working for Indigenous people, especially when you have ceremony involved and you have to be at those ceremonies, then you're going to have to start taking. So they really have to look at that. And um, I, I think even our retirement packages, I think we need to really seriously think about that for Indigenous people. Uh, you know, it is noted that we die 10 years younger. So maybe our retirement packages has to start at a younger age. Uh, because my family, my grandparents all died around early 50s. So, you know, and that's, so we really, my, my father, so we have to think about that is how are we best serving our Indigenous population, right? So thinking outside the box of some of these things that um, will change maybe in the future, but it needs to happen now for Indigenous people. Wow, you've definitely raised some things that were not on my radar at all. And I think important things that most people would say like, oh, common HR practice is just, we treat everybody equal. And these are the things that are part of our you know, benefits package, but not necessarily considering that that applies completely differently in, in others um, in each cultural experience. Um, I'll invite folks to add any questions for our panelists into the chat. And Lisa, did you want to, did you sure. want to say anything? Okay. Uh, I was really struck by Joanne's comment around kind of that sense of impatience and wanting to move quickly. And I, I think maybe as a, a white settler, I have a kind of a different take on that where I feel where I've maybe made some errors and mistakes is when I made assumptions or I've tried to move too quickly to action. And I don't know if it's me personally or being in healthcare, I think it's kind of a workforce full of doers and you want to kind of jump in and, and fix things. But one of the lessons that I've learned is that there's real value in pausing and building that relationship and trust so that you can move forward in a good way. Um, and that's something that through my experiences at the Saskatoon Community Clinic is starting to, to settle with me. And I remember sitting across the table um, with an Indigenous colleague, and, and I was feeling impatient about kind of the pace at which we were able to move forward at things, and she said clear, clearly to me, Lisa, this work will proceed at the speed of trust, and I just thought, wow, like I hadn't heard that before, and it really resonated with me, and so um, it made me realize that this work is much too important to try to do off the side of your desk, or it's not something that you can kind of put in a column and then a check mark to think that you've done it and so I think it's something that you have to be prepared um, if you're a staff in the organization or leading an organization to really understand that this is a foundational change um, to how you work and how you do everything as an organization um, and, it, and it is a journey and it is going to take years if ever um, to move forward with re reconciliation but it's too important of work to just rush or to not give it the attention that it's due. I'm going to quickly jump into Joanne's comment about that uh, was a very, um, in the sense of the insight of what uh, uh, people often go to and um, I guess we could do a better job in explaining if, of the needs of the individual because there is um sometimes um it's trauma in a lot of these communities and we need to find a way to uh indigenize uh, uh, the assistance and support because it's the institution that has to impose and i mentioned imposing and uh, indigenous people are very sensitive to their culture of the grievance and, and various things it's a long-term grievance the other thing that i wanted to mention about um although i'm in the decision making um position that i um, when decision is be being uh, made, I often try to include them, look at it from the uh, community perspective. And sometimes that gets exhausting because you're the one that is trying to 
um, educate at the same time as on top of that. And, and so, uh, uh, and um, it, it, it needs to be, we go to school, but it's not taught in school. And, and I think this is something that needs to change uh, in the institution. Um, and so the other thing that I do want to mention, I didn't, uh, I was reminded about um, this particular subject um, in the cooperative movement and uh, about business, not only in business, but uh, that will support um, being inclusive of um, uh, the other thing I'm going to touch on, two different things. Uh, there's almost a two tier um, of employees of uh, indigenous people are tend to be in the front line and management this tends to be the outside person. How do you blend that and how do you balance the decision making aspect of that and that needs to change in, a, uh, in these kind of uh, settings as well. Um, the other thing is that um, um, uh, to put a positive spin around some of the things that we do, um, the, the indigenizing um, the business um, in our community and uh, several communities in the Arctic community have a pension plan um, that is 55 uh, and up uh, pension plan. And I was reminded of that um, being inclusive about um, their decision making that was requested years ago. I'm going to say about 30 years ago now, but that's in the works and uh, actually it's being um, utilized as well in, in, in the cooperative movement in Canada. And thank you. Thank you, Mary, and to all of you. Well, I realize that we're reaching the hour and I wonder if we can leave the line open for, um, you know, even another five or 10 minutes to chat, but that we close it off for anybody who, who had the hour set aside and that we take a moment to thank our incredible speakers for coming and sharing and, you know, again, playing the role of educator, um, but we really honor and thank you for your work and for, um, sticking with all of the tough conversations that I'm sure you're all having to, to move these things forward and to educate people on a daily basis to try to, um, you know, make your organizations and our communities and our economy, um, you know, more inclusive and, and have everyone see themselves in it and, and see themselves invited to it. Um, so I want to thank all of you. We are recording this, so we will share this so you all can come back to it and, uh, and, and can share it with others as well. Um, I think that we, you know, in last week's webinar spoke a lot to um, really this natural link between the work of being inclusion, uh, inclusive and, and doing inclusion work as really based in a lot of, of who we are in our DNA as a cooperatives and values of solidarity and uh, you know open membership and and these types of things. So I really want to uh, acknowledge that it's it's not just a good thing to do for a lot of the reasons that you heard come up today, but it really is. We really are called to be the leaders in this work. And so I acknowledge all of you on the line who are doing this work, and especially our speakers who shared today. And so I will um, bid anyone adieu who has to, to go now and thank you. And I'll put a couple of links in the um, chat as well if you want to join us. We have two of our winter webinar series already lined up, uh, one for February 11th um, on going beyond the typical narrative of cooperative history globally. And then also uh, in, wasn't just about the Rochdale pioneers. Um, and then the second one is happening March uh, 24th, and that's uh, with this international research project on youth inclusion in cooperatives. And so the links to register for those are now in the chat there. And uh, if you're seeing the video of this, it's at managementstudies.coop for links and for recordings of everything we've done so far. So thank you. And if our speakers can stay for a moment, we will continue on for a moment because we have a, a question in the chat for Joanne. Um, this is from Sarah Hunt who says, uh, Joanne, you mentioned working on reconciliation. Can you say more about uh, the work within the organizational context of Band City about that? Yeah, I think we're trying to do it um, through all the veins of Band City, uh, of trying to not just make it my work, but make it everybody's work. Um, that's going to, it still is a challenge, um, but we're doing a lot of work uh, through HR and a diversity inclusion team. Um, like more acknowledgement of people getting to know their Indigenous community that's surrounding them, so do some of the, the work. 
um, we're, we're with this indigenous lending team, we're hoping to um, again uh, put some of the work, you know, onto the branches of making those connections to the communities. Um, we're doing um, again the hiring of our um, uh, our board of governors uh, the first time. We hope some of that work will stem down from top this way, and then I'm going up this way. So. You know, hoping to find that balance in there. Um, I really want to bring on some uh, next year, uh, starting next year, is to bring into some lunch hour, lear lunch and learn series, and um, to bring uh, Indigenous folks from from different areas um, to educate. Um, because I don't have all the answers, so bring in this wealth of knowledge to uh, some lunch and learns, so that we can spread that wealth. Uh, to our community and uh, they can ask those communities. Uh, right now we're working, uh, some of the work that I'm doing is going outside of our regions. We're not just inside the Van City, Victoria, Vancouver, um, Lower Mainland region. We're going outside uh, onto BC as the request comes in for First Nations people, First Nations communities um, to help work with them because of, they're looking for a, um, not just a, a banking uh, for their services, they're looking for a relationship, a partnership, someone to work together to fulfill those needs. And so uh, we just were acknowledged by one of, the uh, one of the nations actually last week and it was very powerful because we had all our VPs, our CEO, um, many, many uh, Van City staff come together with the community and celebrate uh, this great offering that uh, Van City has given this community to help uh, start their health center. And it was really nice to hear from the elders and the youth and the council and the community of how this has lifted them up. When I talk about the trauma that some of the communities go through with grieving, grieving is huge in our communities. And I think this particular community, uh, I can't even, it's numbers too high to even uh, mention. It's um, but it, it is a, a fact of life. So that, um, yeah, just uplifting our community. So um, not just the community uplifting itself, but outside organizations like us at Van City that go lift up the community and celebrate and, and honor them where they're at. And, and to share, to learn about them first, and then to share what we, you know, if what we could offer to what is meeting their needs. So there's a lot of work that we have to do, um, but I'm really excited about, I feel like Van City is like a sponge right now. They're just like, give me more information, more ideas and more solutions. So I'm really excited that the door is open. Uh, um, it's a two way door, so. Thank you. Right, and Sarah, who asked questions, says thanks so much. Okay, wonderful. Did anybody want to unmute and contribute anything from their own experience, or have any questions they want to voice to the speakers? There you go. Hi, Erin. Hi. Please introduce <laughs> Hi, yourself and tell us, you know, sure. where you're from. Uh, freshly graduated from Saint Mary University. <laughs> Master degrees in cooperative and uh, union, um, and in fact, one of the main reason I took that master degree is to uh, prove to the upper management that uh, co-op principles needs to be refreshed or realigned with our co-op members, uh, and members engagement is really really important because when you say inclusion um, and uh, integration, if you want, but inclusion for non-Inuit or non-First Nation, well, in the case of the, uh, the, the co-ops, uh, everybody is a member. So they need to engage and tell their co-op and their federation what they need and what is right, what is wrong. Um, and uh, just briefly an example that, uh, uh, you know, uh, First Nation and Inuit uh, Esperance de Vie, sorry, and I speak more in French, uh, is lower than the South. Our program of social share is 
been reduced now. Before, at the age of 60, you can withdraw your social share uh, free of tax and what it's accumulated during uh, all your spending. It's a patronage system. And now all 14 co-ops are reducing to 50 years old, 55 instead of 60. So that is great because that's there for them to spend and not after their death, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so adapting and uh, changing is really important and the trust, you know, when, when new employees go up and they don't know anything about the village. And by the way, each town has different way of managing and different way of uh, conceptualizing mm -hmm. the, the non-Inuit that comes in. Uh, so uh, it, it's really important to, to give that uh, one-on-one course of what we're doing, what is a co-op and it, you know, belongs to them and the complexity that our FCMQ is dealing at. Uh, so we offer around 12 services, so name it and either Arctic Co-op is there or FCMQ is there, <laughs> we give uh, all the uh, services. To the communities uh, so so trust and maybe I'll finish with an uh, anecdote um, we, we uh, you know I've been working there for 28 years and when I first started I was you know still uh, doing my bachelor and and an old lady came to see me because I was doing the inventory of 14 co-ops uh, and then she, she goes well how, uh, you don't speak in Nutitude how come you, you're like a white white uh, people now you go down south you get your education and then you come up to work but you don't speak the language and, I, and then i go no I'm, I'm cambodian but i i didn't say anything to her <laughs> not, to, <laughs> not to get to that uh, conversation so so i but but that makes me uh actually honored to work for them and and having lived the war and knowing how hung how famine is and you know the Inuit uh, in northern Quebec had lived that. Uh, a lot of uh, managers, uh, even our last president, uh, he told me, you know, we trust you, John, because you know those values, you know those uh, lack of services or the hungriness. Uh, you know what it is. So you're working hard for us. So thank you for the participant. Uh, it's, it's touchy and, and it's, it's everything that we live every day, eh, Mary, and I know we have that, that same hat sometime and it's, it's not easy. It's really not easy. Wow, thank, thank you. you for contributing to that. So in the chat, Sean has also suggested that we should do a history of cooperatives from uh, First Nations and Inuit perspectives, which would be an amazing. Absolutely, absolutely. And with this, we, we can create uh, something on the web and then, you know, pinpoint every site, all Canada map, and then yeah. we can pinpoint all the First Nations. Wonderful. And if you want, you can share, you have a, a film that was made. Yes, yes, exactly. And, and if you watch the film, look, every time I watch, I cry, a different mm -hmm. part. Uh, and and uh, again, I wanted to say, when you talk about inclusion, you, you put your experience inside too, right? You listen, and at the same time, you share, because Joanne, you, you got it. You have to share, and then you have to listen. Otherwise, it, it's not working. Uh, it doesn't go one way. Um, yeah, so the documentary, it's called Atat Sikut, Leaving None Behind. Atat Sikut means working together, uh, leaving none behind. That's the motto of the Federation. Uh, so the, the, yeah, it's, it's basically uh, telling the story of the creation of the first co-op and uh, the callings, of course, the sculpture. Uh, and uh, so from, from one million dollars of the federation revenues uh now for the whole network we're half billion dollars uh, business wow. so it's it's had increased a lot thank you so I'll, I'll share it yeah yeah please do and add it to the chat too um i think that oh and there's lots of people interested there okay so i will wrap it up there i know everyone's time is precious and tons of screen time. Um, but I also think that hopefully for all of you, the wheels are turning like they are for me in terms of um, what practices I feel called to address next. Um, and really being inspired, I think, uh, 
uh, from, from those folks who are here today and, and the work that's happening. And so I want to thank you all again for being here and for being interested and committed in doing this work and to our speakers for coming in and bringing your experience and for the work that you do behind the scenes that allows you to be someone that we, we invite to share about this. So. Um, Thank you for all of those hours and, and stress and ideas and energy and everything that you put into it. Uh. <laughs> so take care everyone and I'll see what I can do to get this um, recording up and shared by tomorrow. Appreciate you all. Thank and you have all. A, have a happy holiday much. too. Stay safe. Yeah. Thank you. Bye everyone.